The Tennessee Titans have moved up six spots in the draft to the number three overall pick with a 27-17 loss to the Chargers on Sunday. We're going to recap that game, talk a little big picture stuff because I hate getting into the nitty gritty details of a two and six, two and seven team, but that's where we're at. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver with me as always, Justin Mello and Justin. Titans lose again. What's going on, my friend? <laughs> shocking, shocking. They're not, they're not expected at this point. Uh, 27-17 game. You nailed the final score. I mean, I don't know if I'm stealing your thunder by saying that early, but you nail like when we've predicted the game on I think it was Friday I had 23 17 you Bob Barkered me you price is right me uh, I had 20 you were like you know what? not one dollar I'm gonna go four dollars higher than you just didn't go 27 17 but hey credit where it's due you nailed it I nailed it and you know what I also went 12 and 0 in my pick em against the spread wow. league into Sunday night football had Lions minus three and a half Lions won by three so I finished Sunday 12 and one but pretty dang good week of forecasting for me um let's talk about this game here i think we should here's what we're going to talk about so the people are aware before we get into it got to talk about will levis performance finally came back played a decently good game in in some aspects but we're going to break down why some of his numbers may be a little bit more um look a little better than his actual performance was we got to talk about special teams titans continue to just be the worst special teams team i've ever seen in my life (laughs) <laughs> um, got, got to talk about the call that was overturned, the fumble that became an incomplete pass that actually probably changed, uh, uh, maybe changed the outcome of this game. But let's start with Titans have moved up to the number three pick in the draft because that's the good news. Like, well, let's do good news, bad news, good news. Titans move up th- uh, six spots to number three, as I said. They are currently behind Jacksonville, who has the number one pick somehow right now, if the season ended today, and the New York Giants. So as disappointed as you want to be in the Titans season, and it's okay to be disappointed. There were a lot of high expectations coming in. The Jags, currently holding the number one overall pick, has got to be more disappointing. The Jets, oh, cratering yes. into a, a abyss of darkness that's already fired their head coach. The Cowboys, like there are teams that had higher expectations that are having worse or just as bad of seasons as the Titans. So it's not, I think, it, it is what I think it what is. I hate the Titans for the most is robbing me of enjoying this Jacksonville season, you know, right? It's like <laughs> two and eight, like they're, they, they came in. I saw a tweet from a beat reporter this morning out there in Jacksonville saying, like, they thought this was a win now window. Like they spent money, like they're building around. They thought, you know, we're, we could compete and, Number one pick in the draft, and obviously not clinched, might not go that way, but number one, I I forgot, for the third time in five years. Right, and Trevor Lawrence may not play again this season. Shad Khan, the owner, had a meeting with his team before the season where he told them this is the best Jags <laughs> team in franchise history, the best collection of players, the best collection of coaches. All that's left to do is go win. Well, they did that. They won a couple Twice. games. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk. let's talk about it because third overall pick positions the Titans for a lot of options and obviously they have to stay up here and there's no telling if they will or won't. The rest of their schedule is pretty tough uh, in terms of games that are winnable, but they do play Jacksonville. So that (laughs) could be a game that's winnable. Um, So that opens the door for a new quarterback. Potentially you're going to probably get a top two QB in the class with the third pick. If you wanted to assuming that an edge rusher, a tackle or Travis Hunter goes in the top three as well. But those three positions are also on the table for the Titans as well. A right tackle. I don't know if you'd take a right tackle number three overall. That seems highly insane to me in terms of positional value. But a guy like Travis Hunter, one of these edge players that we've been talking about, the Abdul Carters and the Georgia guys and and that group. And then, you know, Shador Sanders, Cam Ward, probably the top two QBs. Jalen Milrow may be working his way back into that conversation after falling out of it a bit for a bit. Um so there's a lot of options at the time. We don't want to spend too long on this because we're going to have plenty of time to talk about it, but that is sort of where things stand with the future of this team. Yeah, I'm not going to add a ton about the draft. I, I think all I'll say is I said last week, uh, don't worry about them being number nine. Plenty plenty of time for them to move up, and there's a lot of two-win teams, a lot of moving and shaking going on. One loss, they go from number nine to number three. So don't get too caught up in it because uh, they could beat, I doubt it, but they could beat the Vikings. You never know what could happen and, and plummet right down like this thing will get decided in week 18. 
Well, yeah, you mentioned the Vikings. They get the Vikings next, a seven-win team. They get the Texans after that, a six-win team. They get the Commanders after that, a seven-win team. So you're looking at nine, uh, 20 wins here combined for their next three opponents. Then's that, then is that game against the Jags, the first one. Then they play the Bengals, which is going to be interesting just because of the Brian Callahan connections and a couple X bengals now on the Titans. And just that game could be interesting, but the Bengals, like despite the record, are a much better team than the Titans are. Then they play the Colts in Indy for that rematch. That's going to be a toss-up game. Then at Jacksonville, another sort of toss-up game. And then they're home against the Texans in Week 18. It'll depend on how the Texans are playing at that point, whether that game's competitive, because Texans may be locked into a seed, or they may be fighting for a two or a three spot um, in the in the conference. So we'll see. But, I mean, at most, you're looking at maybe two wins two more wins on that list and that's if things break right and things have not broken right for this team so let's get into the game things that went wrong here the chargers defense has not allowed more than 20 points this entire season that is where we should start because scoring 17 points on this chargers team has been enough to beat them at points this year if the defense plays well enough but the titans defense right now so banged up they got guys playing ahead of where they should be playing. We're all excited about the future of Jarvis Brownlee Jr., but he's their number one cornerback right now. I mean, Roger McCurry in the slot doesn't, I mean, to me, that doesn't count as much because he's always going to be in the slot. But Jarvis Brownlee lining up on the outside against, you know, team's top receiving options. People in the in the linebacking area getting juked out of their shoes by mobile quarterback. Mobile quarterbacks have been killing the Titans all year. Justin Herbert did it as well. The defense is struggling more than they were early in the year. I think there's two reasons for that. Number one, injuries are the biggest one. Maybe three reasons. Number two, level of competition has stepped up, especially those last few games. You're playing against much better offenses than you were in the beginning of the year when you're playing against rookie Caleb Williams and a Jets team that was still finding itself. Like the the match, the level of difficulty has certainly gone up. The Dolphins with a backup, Malik Willis with a backup, like as a backup, like those those matchups helped the defensive numbers coming into this week. But then you're also dealing with um, a team that knows they're not good and that doesn't have confidence that that if they hold up their end of the bargain, the offense is going to score enough points to win the game. And that affects how guys play. Um, So I I would put this loss more on the defense than the offense, just given the way the Chargers season has gone. But also it was a 27-10 game and the final score was 27-17, but it was really a 27-10 game and the Titans get a late garbage time touchdown yeah you know my only takeaway there is you talk about 17 points no one's really scored more than 20 well maybe the titans should have had 24 if you know i mean maybe that last touchdown doesn't happen but the point is that that defensive touchdown at the end of the second half you know look i'm not going to pretend like i was up in arms uh, over it I, i think both you and i and we've had people in the comments like feel a little numb at two and six two and seven it's hard to get as upset as maybe you would normally get uh, but it was a bullshit call, in my opinion. It's Bush League, and I, I, I don't know what a fumble is anymore, right? Like, I, no con- at no context, Titans, good for them, because I thought of it. You know, putting the Josh Downs fumble uh, from a couple of years ago. You remember that one? Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, hold on, wait, was that you? They posted it. I cut them together originally and posted it when the Saints play happened at the beginning of the 2023 season. Um, yep. And people were replying to my video of the Justin Herbert fumble incompletion, whatever you want to call it. I guess incompletion is what it is. Um, asking no context Titans, can you put all three together? And he went and did it. So kudos to him. But I had, I had done he that previously. He watermarked it too, I think. Well, yes, he. I think he did put his own cut cut together. But I had, okay. I had done that after the the play happened against the Saints too. So I'm not trying to take away any credit from him. He he so. shared it and it was great. But I had. I had shared that side by side comparison almost exactly about a year and a and few weeks so ago. So I'm gonna say fifty percent <laughs> of no context plays and fifty percent of Justin Graver had shared the clip on Twitter. Uh that I I I don't know what it's a fumble anymore. I, I have no idea. I, I thought it was a fumble, to be honest with you. I, I thought I thought Simmons' momentum hitting him is kind of what pushed his arm forward. Like, and I'll tell you, yeah, the commentator, I can't remember who it was. I was, you know, watching half distracted to be honest with Jonathan you. Jonathan Vilma. Live, yeah, live said when they showed the replay, at least on my feed, he goes, oh, that's going to be a fumble. Ooh, that's, that's a, a fumble. fumble. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the, like, that just blows me away. And then Brian Callahan said that they initially told him it was a fumble. Yeah. And then they told him, oh, no, we went back. No. 
just he was irate. terrible officiating in this He week. was irate on the sideline. He was given the ref the Will Levis treatment, the what the fuck are you doing treatment, except <laughs> he was yelling at the refs like that is bullshit. Here's my take on it because I don't know if it was a fumble or an incomplete pass because the replays that we as fans had access to, we never get to see the ball leave Justin Herbert's hand. There is something obstructing our view of the actual moment the ball stops touching his hand. So we don't really know if he's gripping it firmly as he goes from an overhand motion to that sort of sidearm underhand motion with the Jeffrey Simmons contact. We don't know if he threw the ball and flicked his wrist and released it or if it sort of was squirting out like Josh Dobbs. My take on the Josh Dobbs play is it should have been incomplete, obviously. Derek Carr in 2023... Also should have been incomplete. And the only reason that Titans fans were mad that that wasn't ruled a fumble was because of what had just happened in the previous game for the Titans, Week 18, 2022, where it was literally the same play, but that one was a fumble. This one with Justin Herbert, I don't know. I can't tell you if it was a fumble or an incomplete pass because we didn't get to see the ball the moment it stopped touching his hand. So based on the way Simmons hit him and the way the ball, his arm changed and the way the ball traveled, I'm inclined to believe it was more similar to Dobbs and Carr and should have been incomplete. But the fact that they ruled it the way they did on the field, reviewed it with angles where you can't see the ball leaving his hand, and then changed the call is wild. Now, the pool reporter, they did the referee pool reporter interview thing after the game with the guys in New York who tell them why they made the calls that they made. He said they had an angle that wasn't shown on the broadcast where they were going frame by frame to see what moment Herbert lost control of the ball, and it wasn't until he threw it. So they may have had something that we didn't have, which if that's the case, we sort of just have to accept it. But that's also fucking bullshit that they don't have to show us. Like, it doesn't have to be on the broadcast. Social media is a very powerful tool in 2024. Post it somewhere. Show us. Like, look, we made the right call here. Because if you don't, we're all going to wonder. Like, they get the chance to just decide the outcome of that play without having any transparency And it's bullshit. And it doesn't matter for the Titans. It may actually end up helping the Titans in the draft. At the end of the day, there's no moral victories, but at least you know that like that play happened and your defense can make game-changing plays, even if it didn't count. And at the end of the day, you still get the higher draft pick. But it's bullshit that they don't have to show us why and how they made the call that they made. I also, and when you don't show us it, for example, I have a really hard time believing, how can I believe the evidence you have was conclusive? Right. right? So, So to speak, right? Because... Well, that's what we always say. Well, the call on the field really hard to change. It needs to be 100% certain. You can't tell me what we saw 100% certain that that's not a fumble. Like, how do you change that call based on what we saw? Anyway, it is what it is. Titans, as per usual, always on the wrong end of these things, it feels like. I'm not, I, I, we, we should not have gone this long without yeah. talking about Will Levis. That's the only storyline yeah. to me in this game. First start after three games off, um, uh, you know, lo- sideline longer than we thought he was going to be. Comes out here and... I'm having a hard time figuring out how I feel about the performance, to be honest with you, because it's 18 of 23. What is that? 78 point something percent completion percentage is highest of the season. Twice he's of been in career. the mid to high 70s now. Highest, highest of, his of, career. of his career. As you said, twice he's been in the mid 70s, but this was this year, but this was even a bit higher than that. Uh, 18 to 23, 175 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. It's only his second multi-touchdown game of the season. I mean, he's only played, I guess, five or six games, but his second multi-touchdown game of the season. And, and on top of it, first turnover-free game of the season, which I think is the most notable thing. Although he did fumble, it was recovered by J.C. Latham, caught a bit of a break there. Regardless, we'll give some credit for protecting the ball, not putting it in harm's way. Uh, first I game think- of the season that a Titans quarterback did not throw an interception. Yes, yes. First, first <laughs> no, non-turnover game, period. Yeah, for yeah but the interception it, streak was, was it wild. It took until week 10 <laughs> to get that, which is wild. But I will say, you know, as much as I feel, uh, you know, numb, I'm, I'm watching a little distracted, I'm being honest with you, that final touchdown pass to Calvin Ridley, it was so hard not to be a little pissed off because I'm like, this is the throw that's going to drive the Titans crazy. Yes, I know it's at the end of the game. It's meaningless, blah, blah, blah. But for me, just grading the throw, the ball placement was so unbelievably outstanding on that play. It is the type of play that drives you nuts with him. It's the type of play that makes you waste another year trying to fix him and trying to figure it out. Because what an unbelievable, it was one of the best throws I think I've seen him make. 
And, yeah. and certainly this season. Yeah. And, you know, last year he had a couple of great ones. But uh, this year, I mean, it was certainly up there. Uh, frustrating, frustrating. Outside of that, the reason I say, I, I, you know, I don't know how I feel about the performance. I talked about all the good things. The, the caveat for me is the seven sacks, right? You and I, we talk about this a lot. Uh, drifting into pressure, holding on to the ball. Zach Lyons of 104.5 The Zone, F-Words Pod, had posted a tweet yesterday. After the first five sacks, I don't know what this number ended at, but we, I think we can have enough conclusive evidence from five of the seven sacks. Uh, they occurred in an average of 4.6 seconds, which was by far the longest of any quarterback in Week 10. Again, I say it out almost every week. That's an eternity in an NFL pocket. It is forever. These guys are way too good not to get home in 4.6. I mean, they're way too good to not get home in 3.5 seconds more than half the time. 4.6, it's an eternity. Uh, it's the same thing. It's drifting into pressure. His pressure to sack rates is one of the highest in the NFL. Mason Rudolph is one of the best in the NFL. What did I say last week? Mason Rudolph, what, got sacked once in the New England game, once in the Detroit game. No coincidence you get Will Levis back here, seven, seven sacks. Like, the right tackle situation is horrid. I thought as bad as it is, I thought it was even worse in this game. Like it, it, did, it was lower than what my expectations are. So I'm not putting it all, and I've got no expectations, right? But I'm not putting it all on Will Levis, sort of for that reason. It's it's such. A, and by, by the way, Brian Callahan on Monday earlier today, we're recording this, spoke to the media. It was hilarious when they asked him about the right tackle situation. He said there are only so many guys available, and there's only so much we can do. Uh, you know what? Uh, kudos to that answer. AKA they fucking suck, right? Like, and there's, and he's right. There's like, there, yeah, we, we can only play the ones we have. And when we're in third and long, we try to help them out, but it is what it is. That's the honest truth, right? This is a roster personnel issue. It's not a coaching issue. Um, but, but the seven sacks, some of it, certainly a lot of it falls at the feet of Will Levis. It's no, I wrote about it last week. It's no, like I was one of the things I was watching. This goes Two games, one sack each. Now it's seven. Will I think it was Will Bowling, I, I think it was, had a tweet where he said, Titans don't have an offensive line problem. The offensive line has a Will Levis problem. Uh, truth is probably somewhere in the middle, or 80-20 to Will Levis' side. I'll, I'll reserve some of it for the O-line's got a bit of a problem, but uh, certainly uh, it's an area that he continues to struggle with. Here are the time to sack uh, for each of the sacks that he took. This is courtesy of Zach. He sent this in our group chat. He may be planning to use this on the radio today or he may have already done so. And if I'm stealing <laughs> proprietary content from Zach, I really apologize. Go check out Zach's content. He's really good on 104.5. The F Words podcast is great. He's a great Twitter follow. You can follow him on Twitter at... The Zach Lyons. At I know. The, he, it's different He changed now. it. Yeah, at the Zach Lyons. Professional. Okay. He's a professional now. First sack, 6.76 seconds. This is the one where he was like trying to get Chig to turn around and then he just decided to take a massive hit on the sideline instead of like flipping the ball out of bounds for no loss and no hit. Um, that one I think is on him, not because the pressure came, but because he took a sack. Like, and this is something I've been seeing floating around on Twitter too, is like there's a lot of Titans fans who are pro Will Levis still who are saying, oh, earlier in the year you were telling him to just take the sack, don't fumble, don't throw an interception. Now he's taking the sack and you're mad at him for taking too many sacks. Like, no, look, this is a more nuanced conversation. Don't yes. be an idiot on purpose. Like, <laughs> if he's rolling out, this happened twice in this game, once on the chick play and once in the second half. If he's rolling out, knows he's under pressure, and he's looking for a receiver down the field, that is all great. But at the moment when you are finally out of time and you're going to get sacked, you're not going to juke out two or three defensive linemen, linebackers, safeties crashing on you. Like, you're not going to juke these at people the, out. On the sideline already, too. On the sideline already and pick up more than a yard or two at best. You're going to take a massive hit unless you slide down, which if you slide down, you're going to lose yards. Just flip the ball out of bounds. Just make the smart play and get the ball out of your hand. Don't take the hit. Don't put it in harm's way. And don't be an idiot. Just flip Flip the ball out. It drives me crazy that he did this multiple times in this game. And the Chig won the first sack of the game was the first one. Second sack, 3.2 time to sack. Now, Zach watched this play, and he said that Will Levis had a chance to run. He didn't have awareness on where the rush was, and he stared down his receiver. But 3.2 seconds from time to snap to sack is pretty low considering the yeah. compared to the rest of this list. That one I'm inclined to put more on an offensive lineman got beat very quickly. Third sack. 5.7 seconds, he had Josh Wiley and Nick Westbrook-Akina open. That one's on him to me. Fourth sack, 4.04 seconds. We're in the lower range of this list, but still over four seconds. Still high. 
It's not like you're getting sacked immediately. Fifth sack, 4.4 seconds. Sixth sack, 3.51 seconds. That's the second shortest, but he had Tyler Boyd wide open on that time, and he sort of drifted and hesitated and then got sacked. And then the last sack, 4.37 seconds, he had nobody open, credited as a coverage sack, and uh, he just he goes down. That one I'm, I'm less inclined to feel bad about, although that might have been the one the other one he had a chance to just throw the ball out of bounds on. So um, all in all, these are not short time to sack. No. These are long. These are 3.5 plus seconds every single one of them. Again, his right tackle sucks. He's under pressure a lot because of that. But it's not like the O-line isn't identifying a free rusher and he's just like immediately hitting the backfield and there's literally nothing he can do. Like good quarterbacks navigate bad O-line play by their movement in the pocket, their anticipation of where the rush is going to come from, their just general feel, awareness, presence, whatever term you want to use. And Will Levis doesn't have that. He hasn't had it since dating back to watching him in college. He's never been that kind of player. And does that mean he cannot be a successful NFL quarterback? It doesn't. If you build a great offensive line for him, he's got the physical tools that are necessary to success when it comes to making the big throws, having the big arm, the str- the strength, the ability to fit it into tight windows, change your arm angle. Like he can do those things physically, but, and so if you give him a great offensive line, he can do all those things, but you're not going to win championships that way. You're not going to be elevating your teammates that way. And so the question becomes like, do you give him another year and hope that some of these pocket awareness issues start to get better Brian Callahan said that they sit down and watch the plays with him where he could have get, gotten rid of the ball faster and they hope that he can learn from that. At this point, even the touchdown to Calvin Ridley, not the second one, the first one, the yeah. beautiful bomb, was way late. And Ridley had yeah. to slow down Ridley a little bit for, down it. for it. And if he wasn't wide the fuck open, that's a broken up pass. Maybe an inter- it's not a touchdown. Um, best case, Ridley has to go like make a contested catch and he's down at the six or whatever because he is late. He's still not processing and I get it it's only week 10 and it's not that huge of a sample size yet and how much time are you going to give him but you give him too long you end up like the Giants with Daniel Jones where you got a 40 million dollar quarterback who can't read a wide open receiver and and by the way uh the, the really the first touchdown unnecessary pump fake again I'm not quite sure who he was pumping out there there's no safety to move yeah it's, yeah that there was sense. no one there so it was like he, he loves that unnecessary pump fake. couple things I'll quickly rebuttal. Uh, the offensive line play, I say it every week. It's a pandemic around the league. Uh, I, okay, Titans don't have Lloyd Cushenberry anymore. But again, like I, I think we've kind of ingrained it in our brains. This is a really bad O-line. No, Titans are pretty good at four of the five spots. And throughout the season, J.C. Latham. Uh, okay, I know Peter Skaronsky has been a bit up and down, but he has gotten better. Cushenberry's been... Uh, I would say mostly good. Ravens has been mostly good. This is not a horrible offensive line. Brunskill. They've got one. Brunskill was good uh, on Sunday. Yeah, Brunskill was good on Sunday. Exactly. So even though they didn't have Cushenberry, he was still good. Uh, uh, this is not an offensive line that's terrible. I will say the right tackle spot, yes, it is like bottom of the league bad. It is, it is quite frankly, terrible. But there are a lot of bad offensive lines around the NFL. Or there are a lot of average, which I would say the Titans are an average offensive line with one really bad spot. And there are a lot of teams, a lot of quarterbacks doing better with that at their disposal than Will Levis and the Titans are. So it's still a Will Levis issue. I think we'll put a bow on the conversation by saying maybe it sounds like we've been a little harsh on them. I think yeah. you'd agree. I do think this was a very minor step in the right direction. It was a bit of a better performance than we've seen the rest of the year. Now, again, not to sound like an ass, but with the caveat being some of that other stuff was so terribly bad, the bar is fairly low. But this was, you know, again, completing nearly 80% of his passes, multiple touchdown passes, no turnovers, all that stuff is good. And there were a couple tight window throws that did impress me that Calvin Ridley touched down at the end. Like I said, I thought was an outstanding throw, frustrated the heck out of me because that's the quarterback that you want to see him be. Um, but some of the stuff, there, there's room for improvement, certainly with the sacks and the drifting into pressure. And I mean, some of those, like even the shortest one, you said three and a half seconds. I think uh, next gen stats, they the average sack is about 2.96 seconds in the NFL. So he got sacked seven times, and the one that was the fastest was still longer. Than, was about half a second longer, at least, almost a full second than your league average. So right. uh, that tells you it's certainly a will. And the previous games tell you it's it's a bit of a will Levis problem. And and again, I'm glad you said what you said there because we are being hard on him. We are holding him to a very high standard that he's frankly never really played at. 
And that might not yeah. be fair. Franchise quarterback standard. But that's the standard that you need. Like, we are evaluating him on the standpoint of, can this guy be a cornerstone that you build your franchise around, not a placeholder, not a bridge to your next quarterback, not a guy that's going to get you to 10 and 7 and a playoff first round bounce. Like, if you want to compete with the Chiefs and the Ravens and the Bills and the best teams in the NFL, you need a quarterback on par with some of those guys. And I don't know if Will Levis can ever be that. He certainly is nowhere near it right now. The question is, can he become that one day? And I will say, like, there were some great throws. The Nick Westbrook Aquina one, yeah. where it was like just a third down over the middle, and he's got instant pressure from the right side, right tackle is beat horribly pressure in his face and he and he makes the play under pressure and he makes the quick decisive read and it's a very accurate throw into a tight window that's great we need to see more of that so I agree I think we were a little hard on him here and and it was really like you know he played what 20 pretty dang good snaps and like 10 not very good and that's a that's a decent ratio that's a lot better ratio than we were seeing early in the year protecting the ball like he's making little strides in in important areas so maybe we should give him a little more grace because it's not like he's going to come out after what he looked like the the first 5 games of the year that he played four full games and just be a different guy and just like be really good all of a sudden you are looking for the incremental growth i think you and i are just getting a little frustrated that it's like we wanted to see this performance in week one so that the growth from here, like imagine where we'd be at week 10 if this is where we were in week one, but it took 10 weeks to get here, partly due to injury, partly because he frankly sucked for the first half of the season. It is what it is, right? I I think both, I think both of us are being fairly level-headed in the sense where, yeah, maybe it's a little frustrating, but we can acknowledge that it was better and no one's saying pull the plug, right? Like I want to see him. I'm looking forward to watching him play week 11 against the Minnesota Vikings and all the weeks after that, right? Like this is a rest of the year thing. We're going to keep evaluating week to week. And if he gets better, Minnesota, that's a hell of a defense. Brian Flores, uh, they held Jacksonville to seven points on Sunday, one of the top ranked scoring defenses. It's another tough matchup after the Chargers game. If he looks better in that game than he did against the Chargers, we'll probably feel pretty good about it. So uh, TBD, but I want to end this podcast with two points. Uh, I think we've covered most things here, but number one, uh, and this will be quick, but leave it to the Titans. Every time a player leaves, they just always love playing the Titans, don't they? Like, And if you're tired of seeing uh, Derrick Henry and whoever the heck else, Malik Willis this year and all these guys, of course, Hassan Haskins scores a touchdown against the Titans in this game. Credit Jim Harbaugh, by the way, because not that, you know, yeah, yes, I still think Titans should have kept Haskins over Chestnut, by the way, but not like Haskins has been some, you know, game changer on offense for them. But credit Jim Harbaugh for saying, you know what? Uh, they cut you. We know how that makes you feel. Give him a carry at the goal line. Give him a feel good touchdown against his old team. And Bud Dupree, who I think had like a strip sack. I feel like he had more than one sack in this game. Like these guys always play well. Uh, I don't even think I'm going to give you a, I don't, if you want to say something about it, you can, but I'm going to move on to special teams. If not, yeah, that's where I want to uh, go. Yeah, for sure. Death taxes and uh, Titan special teams being the worst thing you've ever seen. Uh, ever in any field of your life period because every week it just seems like there is a like I'm tired of talking about it right it's the big return apparently Brian Callahan said that safety Julius Wood who I don't think you knew who that is which I love by the way Never they claimed him off waivers before the season started that's the funniest part about Never that heard of been him. on the team the whole year <laughs> but um uh, Julius Wood who hasn't played to be fair but Thank you. Uh, Brian Callahan said he fell down, Julius Wood, on the big return and took out like three. Of the, I mean, I, I didn't see it. I got to look back. Did he fall and roll? Like, how did he take out? Like, did he just keep rolling? I should go find this guys. play and set it to the circus music and just see what, what it looks yes, like. Yes, exactly. So all I've got to say about that is Brian Callahan's going to get up there and, and talk about that, how that's bad luck. This has happened, yada, yada. What I'm going to say is it's incredible how much bad luck the Titan special teams unit has every single week, right? It's so unbelievable. Cur they're cursed every week. That's a good special teams unit. They are well coached. They just have a something go horribly wrong, unluckily, flukily, whatever the damn word is. Every single week something goes wrong. It's none of their faults. And uh, one of the big bright spots of the Titan special teams unit, Nick Folk. Missed a field goal. Yeah. But where I'm at with the special team stuff, like, look, we can keep talking forever about how they need to fire the special teams coordinator and blah, blah, blah. Like, again, I don't think that's going to fix anything midseason to do that. So it is what it is. But my takeaway from it is 
concern about Brian Callahan long-term as the head coach. And I know that's kind of crazy. Like he's not coordinating special teams, whatever, but something Mike Vrabel was always very aware of and very smart about was like the margins that you win. This game is truly a game of inches and you got to win in the margins. The hidden yards is what Mike Vrabel used to call them. And it feels like, while it's not directly Brian Callahan's fault that the special teams coordination is not coordinated at all. He should have known I'm taking a head coaching job. I need to build a team that can win in the margins, especially if we're trying to build a rebuilder here, like a rebuilding contender. Like we're going to have to find little edges in places that we don't have talent edges. So we're going to need to win these hidden yards. We're going to need to be great on special. The fact that it's not a huge emphasis that a team in the state that they were in coming into the season wasn't a huge emphasis to try to win in all these margin areas is like, do you just care about calling plays? Because if so, I've said it before, go be an offensive coordinator. You got to care about more than maybe he does. And maybe it's not his fault. Maybe I'm reaching. But to me, it's like a red flag. I'm not saying it is or isn't. It's just a red flag. Yeah. And one thing that bothers me a little bit, to be honest with you, is this fan base, you know, gave Mike Vrabel a lot of shit for he's too loyal to bad coaches, right? Not one of those guys, not one, give me one, had a unit as bad as this special teams unit is. And I say it's all relative. You want to say, well, uh, the only one I could even think of personally is, well, the offensive line last year that, you know what though? The offensive line had Andre Dillard at left tackle and a bunch of bums at right tackle, yada, yada. That was a personnel issue. If the special teams have a personnel issue, that's much easier to solve than an offensive line personnel issue because you kept those guys on special teams when you could have kept others. You get what I'm saying? Like, and he no. made the decision with Rand Carthon for sure, but definitely had a ton of input on to keep Rand five saying tight ends, yeah, to keep chestnut over Haskins, all those guys that are not doing a damn thing on special teams. So there is not one coach in this Titans past that had a unit as bad as Colt Anderson in a special teams unit. So let's talk about loyalty to bad coaches. Yeah, and I think that that's the thing that again, red flag is just like, do you know how to captain the ship of a team and really make those decisions? I don't know. It's TBD. We give Brian Grant Callahan a little more grace than this because it is his first season and he's young and he's got to learn. But like, there's a lot of, a lot of concern about the future of this organization. In my opinion, the people running the ship right now, I don't know that they're the ones to do it. But anyway, we we've talked for long enough about this shit team. Do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> we did not do. No, I'll drink I'm... to that, which we need to do or else we're not going to get paid this month. So I'll drink to that. Brought to you by Sinker's Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. I'll drink to the Titans moving up to the third pick. We already talked about it, so we've got to spend a lot of time on it. Probably should have just done this segment at the top of the show, but um, anything else you want to drink to? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll give you a real thing because that wasn't fair. Uh, 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 Calvin Ridley, two touchdowns with Will Levis coming back. Don't forget how they looked never to be on the same page ever. Throughout the early portion of the season, Calvin Ridley finally breaks out when Levis is sidelined. Calvin Ridley playing a couple of good games under Mason Rudolph. I certainly had some questions if that would continue when Levis came back. So it it was positive to see Will Levis throw a couple touchdowns to Calvin Ridley. Because I I did the math earlier today. Uh, Calvin Ridley had caught, I think, 33% of his targets uh, in the Will Levis starts before Sunday. 33%. That includes, remember, the 0 for 8 game against the Colts. But it wasn't very good. Uh, in the other games that Will Levis started. The first three specifically, right? It was the Bears. I, I didn't count the Miami game, of course, because he got hurt so early in that. But 33%. So it was positive. It was encouraging to see Calvin Ridley have a good game on Sunday. It's the first one with Will Levis as his quarterback. That's a great thing to drink, too. I'll also drink to nailing the uh, final score prediction to the T. All right, I'll drink to that. Brought to you by Sinker's Beverages, the premier wine, spirits, and beer store in East Nashville, serving the community since 1985. Their knowledgeable staff is proud to help you with large parties, themed events, or finding something unique for a special occasion. From birthday parties to milestone celebrations to everyday moments, Sinker's can help with the right drink for every occasion. And if you head to the Sinker'sBeverages.com website or check the link in this podcast description, you can join the in-crowd. In-crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases and more plus they're on uber eats justin we did it we recap this game anything else <laughs> get ready to play the vikings on sunday and, oh my uh, god uh, dude another, will another, levis another is gonna test. take 12 sacks in this game his head is gonna be spinning brian flores is going to coach circles around brian callahan i cannot wait the only thing i'll say is that the vikings offense has looked putrid the last 
handful of games. They Jacksonville on Sunday. Matt Jones, Sam Darnold had three picks against a really awful Jags defense. Yes, so that's maybe the Titans defense will score some points. We'll see. Um, they tried to last week, and the NFL said, no, you're not allowed to. You're the Titans. You don't get to score on defense. Um, all right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We really appreciate you guys if you're listening, but we appreciate you more if you watch us on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed to the Music City Audible. Give this video a thumbs up, like, turn on alerts so you get a channel notification every time we drop a new video. And finally, leave a comment. Drop a comment below. We appreciate all the comments that have been coming in. All the people that are sticking with us through this miserable, miserable season. I know consuming content about your favorite team is a lot harder when your favorite team sucks. So we really uh, enjoy and appreciate everyone who can, comes back every week despite the mounting L's, pile of L's that are just sitting around uh, at St. Thomas Sports Park. <laughs> That's appreciate it. you guys all right until next time y'all stay safe out there and tighten up or i don't know should i hit it tighten hit it down <laughs>